Last week, we started looking at a video from popular flat earther Eric Debay, in which he claims to prove that the Earth doesn't move. Almost 300,000 of you seem to really like that video, and I promised we'd do more, so this is that. Will Eric really provide us with proof that the Earth does not move? Let's find out. Hello all and welcome along to another episode of Flat Earth Friday with me, Simon Dan. Thanks very much for joining me. Now before we begin, I'm the type of person that signs up to free trials and then forgets to cancel them before the trial ends. Sometimes it's taken me months to discover I'm paying for a subscription that I don't even use. Do it all the time. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Rocket Money. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that lets you manage subscriptions, lower bills, make custom budgets and grow your savings all in one place. Now, if you're like me and you're guilty for signing up for free trials and then forgetting to cancel them before being billed, thankfully Rocket Money can help you stay more on top of those subscriptions. And they can even help you cancel them. Now that saves you the time and hassle of cancelling the subscription yourself. The other cool thing Rocket Money does is you can easily create a budget or set individual spending goals by category. Now you can get personalised insights that help you uncover spending habits, like frequent spending on something. So then you can identify areas for optimization. You'll receive weekly or monthly spending reports, and that will help you stay on top of your financial activity. Rocket Money really is fantastic. You can securely link all of your accounts, checking, savings, loans, investments, etc., to create a dashboard to monitor your overall financial health. It's like a bird eye view of your finances in a single app with both high level and in-depth account insights. Now Rocket Money is free to download but you can get a free premium trial when you sign up with my link. Just go to rocketmoney.com slash simandan and I'll also leave a link in the description. Thanks again to Rocket Money for sponsoring the video. Right then we carry on where we left off last time which was Eric about to tell us about the Mickelson Morley experiment. Now he obviously thinks that this is proof that the Earth is motionless. Let's have a look, shall we? It all started in Cleveland, Ohio, at the Case School of Applied Science in the 1880s. This is the idea, which is quite simple. Mickelson thought that for six months of the year, the Earth was traveling toward the Sun, and in the other six months is moving away from it. He persuaded Alexander Graham Bell to give him the funds to set up an experiment with which he built an apparatus he called an interferometer which could measure the speed of light very accurately. Okay, the interferometer was not built to measure the speed of light. Mickelson had already done that. It was built to detect differences in light travel time, caused by motion through the hypothetical ether. Same light speed, same source, different directions. That distinction matters. The experiment already assumed that Earth was moving. It tested whether light behaved differently because of that motion. His original interferometer, made in Germany, was inadequate. So later, he acquired a bigger, more accurate interferometer, consisting of a huge rectangular block of sandstone as a table, floating on a bed of mercury, where the sandstone table could be turned easily in any direction. So the speed of light could be measured from all directions, and at the same time, be free from any vibrations or disturbances. The Newtonian idea was that the speed of light was pushed through the ether, in which case it should vary to the observer depending on whether the observer was moving toward or away from the source of light, and the ether may not be evenly spread and light may not travel at a constant speed, in which case it should vary to the observer depending on whether the observer was moving toward or away from the source of light, and the ether may not be evenly spread and light may not travel at a constant speed. Now the sandstone slab floating on Mercury is real, and of course it was brilliant engineering, but it was built to increase sensitivity, not to measure the speed of light from all directions. And as I said, the interferometer did not measure the absolute speed of light. It compared two light paths at right angles to look for a difference caused by what they called the ether wind as the Earth moved through space. If light were being pushed through the ether, one beam should lag behind the other when the apparatus was rotated. To explain it simply, Mickelson created an apparatus to send and receive a narrow beam of light to a half-silvered mirror which would allow some light through and reflect some light at the same time. They called it a beam splitter. Then the two beams were split and recombined together again. 
The hypothesis was that they expected to see through the lens a light spot in the middle surrounded by a dark fringe, showing partial interference. It is important to note that the arms of the cross in figure 2 were exactly the same distance in length. Both light beams would recombine at C, but according to the ether theory, there should be a delay, where one beam may take longer than the other to traverse the distance, resulting in interference. This is a mostly correct description of the setup, but the conclusion it's steering toward is still wrong. Now Mickelson and Morley did use a beam splitter to divide a single light beam into two perpendicular paths, and they were of equal length. Then they combined those light beams to produce an interference pattern. That part is fine, but here's the crucial correction. They were not looking for a reticular spot surrounded by a dark fringe as a success condition. They were looking for a shift in the interference fringes when that apparatus was rotated. A shift would indicate that one beam took slightly longer than the other due to this ether wind. To understand how this works, it's necessary to briefly look at interference phenomenon for those who are unfamiliar with the concept. This is not as difficult as it appears. Light travels in a wave-like motion. When troughs and crests line up in phase, it is called constructive interference and the beam is bright, as at A in figure 3, two waves in harmony. When the waves are completely out of phase, the viewer sees no light, only a black spot, as the waves cancel each other out, as in B. When the waves are slightly out of phase, a light spot is seen in the middle, surrounded by a fringe of dark, as in C. That explanation of interference is actually pretty fine. Well done, Eric. But the entire test hinged on fringe shift not fringe existence. If the ether wind affected one arm more than the other, rotating the apparatus would change the relative phase, and those fringes would move. That movement would be unmistakable, by the way. You wouldn't need interpretation or belief or philosophy. You would literally see the pattern slide. Mickelson expected to see a black fringe showing the two beams were out of phase, but it was unexpectedly not the case. This is made clearer in figure three, in terms of direction and flow of ether and light. What was expected to be seen at C? One of three outcomes. One, a bright circular light, where the returning light is in phase with the sent light beam, constructive interference, bright. Two, totally black, complete destructive interference, troughs cancel out the peaks, dark. Three, or fringe around a bright light would show partial interference. Mickelson expected to see a fringe around a bright light, partial interference, as seen at C, because he expected the returning light to be slower. Again, the experiment did not hinge on this. All three outcomes are perfectly normal depending on initial alignment. What mattered? The only thing that mattered was this. Would the interference fringes shift when the apparatus was rotated? According to either theory, one arm should be slowed by the ether wind, the other should not. Rotating the apparatus should change the phase difference, resulting in a fringe movement. Mickelson did not expect a static fringe around a bright light. He expected a change, a measurable display Placement when that orientation changed. And what ended up happening, Eric? The result, however, of the experiment was no fringes at all. And since his hypothesis failed, he called this a null result, because there was no out-of-phase light showing returning light beams were slower. So if one of the beams of light had encountered an ether wind, there would be an expected delay. This is what Mickelson Morley expected, that the ether wind would show one beam out of phase with the other. But, surprise, the beams were synchronized, arriving at the same time. What does this mean? There is no ether? This was such a shock to Mickelson and Morley, and to science. The question was, how could light from the sun be transmitted through space? Surely there must be an ether. Mickelson profoundly believed in the ether, and was disappointed, blaming the instrumentation that he had designed, and considered his experiment as a failure. Okay, first correction, there absolutely were fringes. The interference fringes were visible throughout the experiment. What was not observed was a shift in those fringes. When the apparatus was rotated, or when Earth's presumed velocity through the ether changed. That distinction matters. 
They did not report no fringes at all. They reported no fringe displacement. A null result does not mean that nothing happened. It means the predicted change did not occur. Second correction, the beams being synchronized does not mean that Earth isn't moving. It implies that light speed was the same in all directions. Regardless of Earth's motion, that outcome directly contradicts ether theory, not heliocentrism. And the third correction, Mickelson did not dismiss the experiment as a failure due to bad instrumentation. Quite opposite actually. The precision was so high that the null result was unavoidable. Mickelson was disappointed because his expectation was wrong, not because the experiment actually failed. He later repeated and refined the experiment multiple times, and the result stubbornly remained the same. Why a failure? To think that all these years he had believed in the existence of an ether. The experiment appeared to prove the ether did not exist. Most scholars accept today that Mickelson and Morley were dedicated and sincere researchers, and no other experiment has ever been executed with such meticulous care and attention, and repeated time and time again by other scientists also, yielding the same result. The result of the experiment was a null result, based on the hypothesis that the Earth was moving through the ether. But it could also be interpreted that the Earth was not moving at all, and perfectly still, since, contrary to expectation, both light waves arrived at the same time, and there was no delay, and no interference fringes seen. The null result was conditional. It was null with respect to one very specific hypothesis. If Earth moves through a stationary ether, light speed should differ by direction. That prediction failed. But what did not fail is Earth's motion itself. The experiment was never capable of distinguishing between Earth being stationary and light not propagating through an ether. Those are not equivalent hypotheses, and treating them as interchangeable is a category error. So no, this result cannot also be interpreted as a stationary Earth. That interpretation is actually ruled out by independent observations that have got nothing to do with Mickelson and Morley at all. But only three conclusions were considered. 1. The ether does not exist, which means sunlight can travel through the vacuum of space. 2. The speed of light is constant in all directions. Or 3. No effect could be detected either in summer or winter. Critics argue, hey, come on, where was the fourth conclusion? The experiment assumed the Earth was moving, but it could also show that the Earth is not moving at all. This is the obvious fourth conclusion. The Earth is still, in which case it was the stars that were moving and not the Earth. The fourth conclusion isn't missing. As I said, it's already ruled out by other evidence. Earth's motion is confirmed independently dozens of times over, using methods that don't rely on light interference at all. So no, scientists didn't avoid an obvious conclusion. They rejected an already contradicted one. That experiment just removed ether from physics entirely. Nevertheless, Mickelson and Morley were hailed as heroes, put on a pedestal, and praised. The publicity for the time, especially in science circles, was huge. Mickelson and Morley paved the way to probably the greatest scientific revolution of the time, the theory of relativity. But some scientists, however, were not happy with these conclusions. Far-sighted scientists of the day realized there was a fourth conclusion that was unreported, and sooner or later, this error would be seen. Sooner or later. 140 years is uh, quite a bit later, isn't it, Eric? So mathematicians came in to offer some refinements. They believed there was a chance the experiment could be saved, if it needed to be saved, that is. In 1892, the Irish physicist George Francis Fitzgerald theorized that one of the arms on the interferometer had shrunk in the direction of motion, even though the arms were of equal length. The theory was supported by the Dutch physicist Hendrik Lorentz, who produced a set of equations that between them came to be known as the Lorentz-Fitzgerald contraction equations. Their mathematical formula claimed to prove that parts of the apparatus Michelson and Morley used had actually changed size physically, literally, a claim which can never be falsified. They did not step in to save a failed experiment. They were trying to explain why the ether prediction failed if the ether did in fact exist, which at the time was still an open question to be fair. But here is the crucial correction. Length contraction was not invented to protect heliocentrism. It was proposed to reconcile ether theory with Michelson and Morley. In other words, this was an attempt to rescue the ether 
not Earth's motion. Later it turned out that the ether wasn't needed at all. Einstein showed that space and time themselves behave differently at high speeds, and that tiny length changes are a real effect. One we now measure directly in particle accelerators and GPS satellites. The question arises, if the experiment was such a success, why would mathematicians be required? They moved the goalpost and tried to change the rules so they could win the game. The Lawrence Fitzgerald contraction formula, as they came to be known, are seen as mathematical proofs of theoretical ideas, assuming the reality of heliocentric theory, which can never be falsified. And why would the formula be necessary if the Michelson-Morley experiment was such a success? Thousands of highly qualified scientists accept the formula as proof of heliocentricity to this day, proved by mathematical modeling and prediction. No modern physicist will point to the Lorenz Fitzgerald contraction as evidence that the Earth goes round the Sun. Earth's motion was already established centuries before by astronomy. These equations are now understood at how space and time behave at high speeds, not as an argument about whether or not the Earth moves. In modern physics, heliocentrism does not need saving, and it hasn't for a very long time. And that is where we're going to leave Eric today and wrap up another video. Next time, Eric moves on to Foucault's pendulum. You do not want to miss that one. Please do let me know what you thought of this one in the comments today, as I say we're all done and dusted for another video. Thanks so much for watching today as ever. If you enjoyed it, please do consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the thumbs up button too. I've been Simon Dan. Have yourselves a great day, and I'll see you tomorrow for another Saturday session where we're going to go look back at the confidently incorrect people of the internet. Always love that one. See you then.